Okay, uh, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for being here in this presentation. Uh, I, I want to present uh, Professor Parra. Uh, Professor Parra is a research professor and leader of the Bioproduction System Unit in the Institute of Advanced Material for Sustainable Manufacturing at Tecnológico de Monterrey. Uh, he has a PhD degree in biotechnology at the University of Cranfield um, in United Kingdom. Uh, also, Professor Parra has a postdoctorate in the University of Westminster in the United Kingdom, and he was visiting professor at MIT in the laboratory of Professor Robert Langer. Uh, also, uh, he was in the in, in Harvard University for a short stay. Uh, Professor Parra is a co-author of more than uh, 260 scientific articles in international journals um, aligned to Scopus. Uh, he has 15 books, captures, and two books. Uh, at the moment, he is coordinating, uh, and he was coordinating a 30 research project funded for more than uh, 150 million of Mexican pesos by, by national and international entities. Uh, Dr. Parra is an inventor of uh, 18 uh, granted patents in Mexico and international for development of bioprocesses and also bioproducts and uh, photobioreactors. Uh, he has um, international collaborations uh, in, the, in the area of biotechnology and bioprocesses uh, with a robust network um, across academic and industrial sectors with more than uh, 200 uh, research groups. Uh, Dr. Parra is also a member of the National Research System in Mexico. He has the lever number three. And is, uh, mm, he was a coordinator of the International Network LIDA and also Bio, BioCATEM, uh, which was a, a, a network uh, in, in the CONACYT for development of biocatalytic processes and biomaterials. And also he is the director and founder of uh, MARTEC, uh, which is a, a national as a laboratory for the analysis of uh, wastewater uh, epidemiology uh, to monitor the COVID-19 uh, in a program aligned to the tech community. Uh, I want to receive Professor Parra. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I think I don't need this one. I think, I think you'll be. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Aelda. Really, thank you for the presentation. And amazing to, to have these uh, researchers like Dr. Aelda part of our team. I'm going to present uh, our unit, Bioproduction System Research Group. It's a, it's a unit in the Institute of Advanced Materials for Sustainable Manufacturing. And the plan is to try to change and reshape industry. So for that, we have, we have an amazing team also that uh, I will uh, introduce at the end of this presentation. It's very ambitious. I'm going to go very fast flicking over the presentation because we have so many slides. But I try to capture all the activities that our team is doing. It's not me. I'm just, I'm just the, 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 the words. <coughs> but behind is a, is a huge team uh, in our group. So we're going to talk about circular economy in general for those that uh, probably not very involved. If you are involved, I can uh, rephrase some, some ideas with you about C uh, circular economy. Uh, we can talk about uh, CO2 sequestration, high value products from microalgae. Uh, also, we're going to talk about sargassum. Now it's a big hit, you know, it's, it's affecting the whole world. Also, we, wo we will talk about our research in enzymes. Martek, as Dr. Aelda mentioned here, and also the new research lines that we are currently working. In case you are interested, please come, send us an email, and we can talk and meet of the whole team. 
So let's start with circular economy. We talk about this, these SDGs, they're very important, and we need to tackle this in order to survive in this planet. So it's a big, it's a big issue, it's a big work. We need to solve problems from poverty so from, to life in the, in, the, in the water, life on land, climate change, so on. But I really like to show that the 17 is partnership, collaboration, which is very important. The only way we can survive is through collaboration. And based on this circular economy, oh, sorry, circular economy is, uh, is this, so we are going to talk about CO2 sequestration, recycling, recycling at some point because there is a need to uh, find regeneration. That's actually the word we need to start implementing in our vocabulary is regeneration. Not recycling because recycling has a very clear limit, no? But regeneration is another matter. Probably more than 90% of the waste need to be regenerated, not recycled. So for that, we're going to see the opportunity to increase income, business, resource uh, reduction of the, our dependency on this, and of course, recycling, regenerating, that will be. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so I'm talking about microalgae. Microalgae is not new, of course. Remember from our books, old books, life in the planet started with microalgae when they started to produce oxygen, so changing the atmosphere. Of course, some previous forms of, of, of organisms before that they take um, other sources of uh, nutrients, but then microalgae started kicking off in the planet and then turning the atmosphere in oxygen. So with that, evol evolution came, and you see all the sources of, of new life, you see, and now we depend on oxygen. And who's producing all oxygen? Of course, plants, but mm, it's very important, the contribution of oxygen from microalgae. So in this sense, oh, sorry, this is one. We are working, this is, this is a work that was published with, with one of our students, um, Itzel Lopez Pacheco, and we make a plan to try to, to make Mexico City carbon neutral. So the design of big reactors made of microalgae can turn Mexico City in sustainable. So this is the size, of course, people ask me what's the cost of this, we don't know yet, but these massive reactors but in the future, we will see the way we can mingle with microalgae in our buildings in order to reduce the CO2 emissions. Also, one of the first uh, attempts to, to try to prove that microalgae are suitable for this uh, fine task is basically we run some experiment using CO2. So this concentration point, uh, CO3, is the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere, <clears throat> but that is not only uh, the challenge. The challenge is CO2 in industry that got, goes up to 10, 10%. We try even 20%, which is too high. But what we see here in these graphics is microalgae are able to thrive and to live even at very high concentration. There are two different strains, Botrococcus brownie and Cenedesmos, and you see that are able to cope with a very, very uh, highly concentrated uh, effluent of CO2. So microalgae is able to take that big task. So we are concerned about CO2. Microalgae is maybe the solution. So also on, on the way, also produce carbohydrates and lipids. In this other experiment, again with itself, it's a very nice and fine experiment working with CO2, 10 and 20%. It's too high, really. The, the big cement industry is producing probably 10%. So 20% is something that produces more CO2, it's too high. But it's able also, if you see, to grow the microalgae, these are the, the, the grow curves, even at 20%. But we add another variable. We use wastewater. So we are able to grow microalgae in a wastewater system, and we are able to capture CO2 and produce a sustainable process all together, all in one. So it, this is a good result. 
So uh, as a summary, I make summaries of each of these uh, uh, work separately to see. Xenedesmos is a good strain, it's a, a potential strain to try to change wastewater systems that currently we have using archaea or bacteria for microalgae. Why? Because we are going to capture CO2 and reduce the energy consumption. So that is very strong, strong statements here. Also, we are able to, to sequestrate continually from a 10%, 8.4% sequestered of CO2 in this system. And by the way, the system is also able to remove nitrogen and phosphorus. Nitrogen and phosphorus, you know, is a big problem in lakes because of the problem of algae blooms. So if we remove, also we are able to reuse it in agriculture. So this is a, a very important. So in this way, we are contributing to the Institute of Advanced Material for Sustainable Manufacturing with a new shape and phase of uh, process. And we publish so many papers, of course. We have Professor Hafiz here in the group. So he's top number one in Latin America and is really, really uh, pushing the boundaries of science. So it's a team, uh, I would say. This is a, this is a project with uh, Dr. Elda Melchor where we tackle the problem of uh, new alternative to petroleum der derived materials because this is another big challenge. Plastics <laughs> polluting everywhere. And the microplastics are polluting worse even the blood of us. If somebody take a sample of my blood, they will find some plastics. Bad enough, no? So we need to change this. In, the, in this way, we make this study and try to, how can we implement the transition to new plastics in this paper? Um, uh, other, uh, another thing is how can we produce uh, uh, carbohydrates? We can produce uh, polyhydroxyalkanoids that are basically the units, the monomers for the production of plastics. We can make plastics out of microalgae, but these plastics are not the same plastic. They, these are plastic that are biodegradable or biocompostable. Also lipids for many, many things. We started with the transesterification. We produce biofuel at the beginning of my research, but now we change to omega-3 for food because the big challenge now is to provide food for everybody. So this is another big impact, another column in, the, in our project. The accumulation of lipids, of course, we study. I'm not going to get into this uh, too deeply, but we try to combine the production of lipid, but also the production of um, uh, phytohormones to make apples bigger using the auxin that is produced here in the same, in the same process, no? Also, we deal with this uh, autotrophic and heterotrophic. Autotrophic is, we, we basically, we make microalgae grow only with uh, light, but we also add sugars. Microalgae is also able to grow, grow faster. So both cases can be studied and uh, basically we can produce more plastics. That was the aim because we need to substitute uh, the plastic that we have for this new plastic. And the design of experiment was based on glucose, nitrogen, phosphorus, and iron. And the main, main factor is the interaction with, uh, with uh, phosphorus and iron and uh, glucose, of course, because we can produce more uh, re uh, reservoirs of molecules for Senedesmus. And these are the graphics you see. We have, we have different molecules, pH8, plastic, lipids, carbohydrates, and biomass. So what that make you think immediately about a refinery? This is a biorefinery because produce several molecules so the market can be split in different areas. So this is something that we done. And uh, well, as you see, the, the iron concentration, the low glucose, nitrogen, and phosphorus allow the production and the synthesis of bioplastics. This, the biomass also achieve a, an acceptable level of growth. And we are able to produce 0 0.171 gram per liter of, of bioplastic, let's say. So it's still a long way, <clears throat> but we're working on that. And of course, the publications um, are very important to prove 
that we are achieving and is validated by the community, no? So um, let's, let's go to another alternative for the, the, the microalgae, basically. We try to produce several molecules from anti antioxidants, immunomodulators, uh, uh, humectants for the cosmetic, juicy collagen, and uh, hyaluronic acid, and we can produce it here. Uh, drug delivery as, as some of the molecules that we, we are able to deliver particularly in certain organs and of course we are mainly in this area now we are trying to produce phaco, phaco protectors, uh, psychoanamine, mycosporine like amino acids to change the formulation of UV protectants creams because that, that, the, the, the synthetic ones are affecting the environment and these are natural. It has a huge potential so let's Let's apply uh, this. This is something that we have very good progress. So, phycopigments is a big business for, for microalgae. You're talking about business and talking about sustainable manufacturing. We can produce very complex molecules using microalgae like phycopigment, phycoerythrin, phycocyanin, omega 3, and other pigments like um, astaxanthin, for example, that's very important. So this is, a, this is an area that we are working and finding opportunities to, to start up companies. This is work with Manuel Martinez. Uh, that's a nice uh, compilation of uh, documents on this area. <coughs> this, is a, this is a work that was f funded by Newton Fund. And the idea of this project it was to produce this purple molecule this is Porphyridium purpurium. This is a microalgae that grows on the sea, but not in the surface, in the depth. That's why the temperature, the, the light, need to be very well controlled. Otherwise, it's not able to grow. So why we make the, all this trouble to get this molecule or this microalgae? Because the cost of this molecule is $1 million per kilogram. So it's a huge market. You see the value, the trend of the production of future medicine, it will be in this area. So this is a, this is a project, we have all this system set in our group, so um, we can produce actually the molecule right away. We started with BACS, BACS is a good system, it's a very simple system, and with Laura Rodas we scale it up the process and see, you see the, the, the trends are very similar, but you can see that they are different different volumes, so we basically give a very good uh, academic study on the scalability of the process. You see the different graphic of the different volumes, but almost uh, following the same pattern. Of course, it, it's a bigger in 16 liters. It's, it's an obvious uh, observation because it's easy to mix, no? As the volume it gets bigger, it's more difficult. The challenge is in the large volume, not in the small volume. But anyway, it follow the, the, the trend. And of course, again, the concept of biorefinery, you have a lot of lipids that we can produce under different conditions. So we can, we can customize the composition of the lipids in the system. So successful application of a bio, photobioreactor, scale it up with lead energy, lead light. And of course, we are able to produce molecules of high value. So you see the application. We try to find something that is very suitable for the market and design the whole process, part of the bioengineer bio part of the work. So it is important. Of course, uh, with a good idea, it comes a lot of people funding opportunities to, to collaborate and, of course, uh, publications. And this is a very interesting project, and I, I believe is, we should be united to try to tackle this problem. Sargassum is a, is a big problem, not only in Mexico or in the Caribbean, but in all the world. So um, we need to try to think about how can we implement a biorefinery of sargassum, and for that we are working in the valorization, high-value products. Dr. Aelda is really pushing this system forward. And um, some of the studies that we were carrying out is about the, 
Well, the, the arrivals of this sargassum in Cancun, mainly in Cancun, but the sargassum is everywhere. We have a project with um, Africa also. Um, but basically, yes, well, this is what we see even in the US now. You see Florida, Florida case are flooded with sargassum now. Bra Brazil is flooded with sargassum. Africa is flooded with sargassum, so it's getting everywhere. And it's going to be a big, big uh, uh, challenge, I think, to deal with this staggering amount of sargassum. But on, on the other hand, we need to supply more food for society. So biorefinery, this is what we see in the biorefinery, bioenergy in one case, biomaterials, bioremediation, ag ag um, agropecuaria, agropecuaria is agroindustry, I think, bioproduction. So the opportunity that we see is turn this uh, waste, and this is a study with, uh, with Sara and Dr. Elda and Dr. Hafiz in the, basically assessing the different composition of, of sargassum for many things because we will have a lot of doubts at the beginning about how can we use sargassum as it knows to, to collect a lot of metals but we assess that and we find that it was actually safe at low levels, so no problem with metals. And this is a very nice study in collaboration with, with the University of San Andreas and Sibnor. And you see this little fellow, it's a shrimp. Actually, it's a shrimp. And the shrimp, that shrimp is normally grow at this condition in this media. Ah, oh, they told me not to move far from here. So this is a... This is the normal way of, of the shrimp, but when we mix with sargasso, look at the super shrimp that we can get. A nice opportunity to supply more meat to the people. No? Also a nice formula that uh, we are developing and not yet published, so don't take pictures, please. <laughs> but it's going to be published soon. So this is a, this is a nice extraction of fucoidan. That's a nice molecule for pharmaceutical application, and in this case, we combine um, different uh, methods to extract um, this molecule. Really interesting because the combination of the two methods give a significant yield, and this is going to be patent. Uh, again, I'm not going to mention more because it's going to be published. So papers, again, come along with, uh, with these good results. Of course, this is a, a, group, it's a group effort, and uh, Dr. Melchor was leading this uh, study. Valorization of sargassum, new biomaterials. So it's a huge, it's a huge uh, area. And now I'm going to talk about briefly because of time, about these enzymes and particularly these fungi. Maybe you are familiar with fungi, maybe not. Fungi are everywhere. Fungi are everywhere is really lots of uh, different varieties of, of fungi, species of, of fungi, but this is a Pycnoporus sanguineus, it's a basidiomycet. Normally, these fungi rotten away in forest. So taking all the nutrients from uh, decay wood, and uh, also has a potential for pigments, but uh, mainly focus on the lacase and the transformation that this enzyme is able of performing an uh, amazing task. First of all, where is the problem? Why we are bothering again with the lacase is because there is a leakage of so many molecules that affect the living organisms that we need to stop, we need to halt this condition by implementing a new system. We, we know about the, these endocrine disruptors and the damage that cause to the people and to the living uh, uh, animals and plants, but uh, what will happen if we use lacase, we may be able to break these structures. These structures are similar to lignin, so lacase is suitable to break down this structure. No, I'm not going to get into much detail, but lacase has copper in the active site and is able to start the reaction of phenolic structures in this area, actually this is the part where the organic compound comes and this is when it's close as the final product is water. So it's green process, really green process. And probably in the future maybe we will be see batteries made of lacases. 
So that's also still a long way, but a very interesting area that we can work. And this, this lag case is CS43. I always mention the story. But the story is this CS, CS, you know, CS is because Cerro de la Silla, horse saddle, the horse saddle mountain here was the place where this fungi was grown. And it was isolated from there and take it from there to the lab and then scale it up and find this very interesting medium basin tomato juice. Tomato juice is a very standard media and was amazing because it's, you see science is, of course, many things you plan, but also is a lack, it's part lack, no? You, you, we get this result because we add tomato juice in the formula, but there are many, many other formulas that fail. But this was very successful. So this is a medium based on tomato juice that produce a lot of, a lot of lacase at the industrial scale. And this work with uh, Leticia Ramirez, my, my former PhD, she did the amazing work on this, the characterization of these two isoform of lac cases. These are the, the gels, you see, two bands. Then we thought, oh, maybe we have two lac cases. It's not only one lac case, there are two lac cases. So definitely after addition of some enzymes to break down the, the, the sugar, in the molecule, we still see, you see, the whole molecule without sugar, you see two bands. And these two bands are because there are two different lacases. And we try the two different lacases in the system. And you see, this, um, this is lacase, lacase one, lacase two, and this is the cocktail. The cocktail means we are not working on the downstreaming of that because it's going to be apply in the environment, so it's a waste of money. So if you see like that. But we have the purified enzyme, and what we see is the stability, the term, in this case is the, the stability over the time at different pH. And you see at pH 5 or pH, um, pH, pH um, 7, 8, you see the stability that it, it has at some pH, like this uh, 3, it can last a lot. Seven was the top. Seven was the, the, the top um, with the stability of more than 300 hours or 500 hours in the cocktail because some of the molecules may protect the enzyme. But 500 hours is, is a lot. You know, enzymes are very fragile. This enzyme is very tough and very tough. So if we run the experiment at different temperatures, it was worse. Actually, I make this comment because uh, Letty said, oh, doctor, I need to graduate from my PhD. And this lack case, with some words, is still active after 1,000 hours. Oh, that's really a lot. Imagine an experiment like that. It's, it's hard. So it's very interesting because it's one of the most thermostable enzyme found in nature. That's amazing, no? And we have it here in, in Monterrey because very tough climb, no? It's an extremophile, of course. So some of the publications regarding the structure, these are the structure, basically, I, I introduced you to these two lag cases that we have. We try the model with the endocrine disruptors, nonilfenol and triclosan, and they fit very well, you see. And in less than two hours, nonilfenol is gone. So it has a huge potential for uh, application, yeah? Same, same with triclosan. Uh, the applications of, of lag case is, uh, is not free. We need to immobilize in some way, fix to something to, to reuse enzymes for many, many cycles. And this is a project uh, that we have, uh, and actually we published with, uh, with my student, uh, Lynette Alvarado based on the design of this system, that it can run several. You can see every color is a different cycle. So we are able to re reuse the enzyme several times. So you see the stability is almost excellent. You see, you can see that they are not losing activity. They lose a little bit of activity in some points because the enzyme is released to the environment. 
or this is the different, this is uh, what you see. If we mobilize in the support by, by electro spinning I, or entrapped or using adsorption or covalent binding. So you see the different structures and you see the enzymes located in some points of the, of the network. Now we are working in this. This is a project with Professor Hafiz, actually he's the leader, designing these elect magnetic nanoparticles. So we are going to be able to extract with just a magnet. The enzyme can be reused, take it out of the system and maybe continue with another reaction inside of the vessel. Some uh, stability studies that we run to try to find the stability and you see if you immobilize, you can increase the stability of the enzyme much longer than when you have free system because it decays faster. So it's also a proof of concept that is published in, this is part of, of course, the collaboration with Magda Rostro and all the team on uh, lacase and biocatalysis. Um, well, the conclusions are, as I said, this suitable, lacase are suitable for degradation of endocrine disruptors, and some chemicals, and the immobilization increase the efficiency. And the, this is, a, this is a, another um, a landmark project. This is a, a, a project that was very important because during, during the pandemic outbreak of COVID-19, we started measuring wastewater and assessing the concentration of viral uh, molecules in the water. So this is a nice way to try to find a better way to, to um, assess the health of the population. And also now we're expanding to, pat, uh, to pathogens, drugs, and so on. And the concept is uh, uh, wastewater-based uh, epidemiology, but also we talk about the concept of uh, urban metabolism, because it can assess the city as an, uh, an organism, and we can see what is going to be the failure in the future for the, the, the population or the risk of the people. And with this graphic, I like this graphic because it shows how, you see, at the beginning, pandemics takes a lot of time to repeat another outbreak. A lot of, you see, more than 1,000 years between each other. But look at the end. They are coming very often. So we need to be prepared. This is something that will happen again. So this is a work that we started with um, Tecnológico de Monterrey, Arizona State University, Dublin City University, and King's College London. And we established this nice program in order to monitor the COVID. And other molecules, many molecules to assess this. The, actually, the study was in London in uh, the US and in Monterrey to assess the different molecules that we are intaking, medicine, drugs, food, and so on. So it's very interesting because we, you can assess what is happening. And of course, a good idea, as I told you, a good idea, bring a lot of money and brings a lot of projects. So we have so many projects in collaboration with so many institutions. Of course, the big, biggest project and was actually the biggest projects in the world at that time with Tech de Monterrey and Arizona State University that we assess the health of the, the population of all the campus of Tech de Monterrey. That's a really large project. So we were assessing and we designed this scale of risk and another uh, app for uh, decision makers. And we won the prize of best project uh, in Latin America 2021. Mariel Oyervides is there receiving this nice prize um, in 2021. But we collaborate with, with CSIC in Spain, uh, GCSO funding a project and so on, and Tecte Monterrey, of course. Um, uh, of course, there is a, there is a big project with, uh, with FEMSA in the collaboration of, of this uh, project that this is the next generation. Uh, we call it like that because we try to find the different varieties of COVID as you see, some are more pathogenic and some are less. So we assess the, the process with this, uh, this um, protocol. And this is an example that we are able, you see, it's very nice because you see assess, find that probably somebody is ill, isolated, and clean, green again. See the graphic now, the logic of that? So every, everyone, every, every 
every now and then you see a, an outbreak and it was controlled because we assessed. Of course, it's with the, with the text, text uh, salute. With, it was a nice collaborative uh, project. And now we have this project with UNAM and Politecnico and SACMEX, that is the water utility, try to assess in some points the, the, the concentration of virus. And we have, of course, the, is, is now we have a, a national protocol for MARTEC national protocol in UNAM and Politecnico so that everybody can follow the same standardized method. So it's good now that we Take the Monterrey implemented this, so that this is nice. This is the graphics that we have in the in the maps showing where the outbreaks are coming. You see in different areas, you can see how dangerous is that area regarding the risk of getting COVID. A nice, nice project also. Uh, this is again the different variation of concerns that is carried out, and they, again, how is the, of course, this is more difficult to control because we're talking a super large city. See, but you can see different varieties. This is um, another paper, actually work, that we try to implement the protocol, but exp expand it to, the, let's, let's say, the porcine flu or other, well, chikungunya, for example, um, in, in the case of some viral infection and see how is the risk using a microfluidic device, no? And the sensor, basically. And these are some of the drugs that we are planning to assess. This is more related to depression, you know, because drugs are, we can find it in the, in the wastewater and also now new, very trendy fentanyl. That's a big risk of, of health in the uh, US and in Mexico. So this also can be assessed through base uh, water epidemiology. The, the other pathogens, we're talking about pathogens. Another disease like Alzheimer is what we are working currently now. And there are some papers related. And this is a project funded by FEMSA that we are very glad of this uh, sponsorship for research. And you see the results. So wastewater epidemiology, we believe, is, is the future. And other projects of circular economy, we are trying to produce enzymes and, uh, and products using uh, circular economy in aquaponic systems. And uh, uh, Dr. Georgia is here and she's leading that part. And the plan is to establish these this, this new structures to produce food in cities because people are moving from the farm to the city, but we need to produce more food, but we have less water, so, so many constraints. So circular economy, vertical urban agriculture, circular economy in the city is going to be the future, no? Well, this is some other project transformation of enzymes, waste. We have some plants and actually we are very focused in this part in the, in the, in the okra, which is the cake from the soya milk production for make new superfood with, with um, uh, Dr. Rafa, that is here somewhere there, but yeah. And uh, this is a project of circular economy. This is another project that we're planning to uh, implement uh, with OXO. And that, that will be very nice because we try to see the future of circular economy in shops, in business, because it's still a big lack, big gap there that is not completely fulfilled. We are working with that, with Dr. Aelda, that is working in that part. Um, circular economy with shrimps, of course, chitosan, and some molecules. But basically, this is, a, this is, again, a concept that we publish, um, basically funded by OXO, uh, in that regards of the design of new plastics. So this is a project that we have uh, on the uh, this is, a, this is a, a big problem is most of the fruits are wasted. Yeah, we need to find a way to extend the lifespan of fruits and we're designing a coating, special coating that make your strawberry be fresh for much longer. Even the advert is almost ready, no? <laughs> Thank you. So this is, the, this, is a, this is another project of Ketosan, uh, same related to the coatings. Um, Probably the time is, is ticking, no? almost my time is up. So 
this is wound healing uh, process using, basically we need to, to design a patch and we started that, we applied, we didn't succeed in getting the funding, but it's a nice idea to try to use um, waste products from agroindustrial to make polymers and to deliver some molecules to prevent or to help the wound healing process naturally. And some of the papers that we produce, um, sustainable application. This is, this is, a, this is a, a project of Professor Hafiz. Of course, he can explain it much more than me, but this is an alternative of using uh, carbon nanodots to, to enhance the, the photosynthetic pathway of microalgae, allow them to grow and to use more CO2. So we can make it more productive using uh, these carbon nanodots and some other application that can be done using a natural method, using a li lime as a lime, lemon juice as a, as a solvent. So it's very interesting project because it is uh, natural, it's, it's green process and some of the publications uh, here. And this is uh, the last part is how can we see the future connecting all lower research lines with a circular economy, no? working on fish, plants, microalgae, and have the biorefinery in the system like this. This capture, probably in the future, we'll see lights like this. We are working on that, designing new, new lights, working companies like Ecos try to expand our research from, from the lab to the industry and directly translate it in some good results that impact. And this is the team, the whole team is a large team. It's Professor Hafiz that I'm ha happy to have him here. Dr. Aelda, Eduardo is in Denmark, uh, Dr. Reina Berenice also here, and our whole team. And thank you to all. Thank you for helping me to put this presentation like this, try to um, basically collapse as much as we can, but we have so many research, so many things that we wanted to share. Thank you very much. I think uh, that's it. So if any question, give me a WhatsApp or message or email. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Parra, for your interesting presentation. And now we uh, want to open the space in the forum for questions. Does anyone in the forum has Don't questions? Also, if the people uh, connected online want to ask something. Questions okay. or comments? Yeah. We accept comments also. Come on, don't be shy. No? Okay. Please. I can give it to her. Thank you, doctor. I have a, a brief question uh, regarding the uh, circular economy. I would like to know how are you going to address or what will be the recommendation based on public politics and uh, the sustainable objectives? How research and public politics can uh, merge in order to accelerate this type of, of super interesting investigations? Thank you, Nora. Thank you. That is a fantastic question, actually. Uh, it is very relevant if we cannot provide an environment uh, and the laws and the regulation to implement technology, we will be very uh, behind uh, and definitely the, the, the not having the research in place represent big losses for Mexico, for example, that we are living here. If we are not having the public uh, policies on regulation and the regulation of, let's say, how can we uh, discard the water and what is the quality, or if we, there are going to be incentives on the circular economy 
uh, it's going to be difficult to take off. This will be nice ideas of a dreamer. Think, okay, the ideas are really wonderful, but if there's not regulation, people tend to ignore. So um, definitely we need to collaborate. It happened in different countries. I've been in, in um, Sweden, and they have a very close co collaboration with universities, academia, academia, government, and business. And all of them work together, sit together, and have the plan for the future. And then the laws will be linked to science. That is important because that's the way we can establish some limit of certain molecules in the water that prevent the probably dying of tons of fish in the future, or to ensure to have water. Again, it's a policy that needs to be implemented. So very nice question. I think we need to work together. That is the, the question government and, and uh, universities, of course, need to be some, somebody that connect both and this industry, that need to take the, the risk to turn these ideas, this research, into something that can be implemented. Yeah, you're welcome. Dr. Parra, tenemos uh, two questions more. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor Arturo Monina asks, what is the potential to make a business case for, for the sargassum? Uh, the, potential, the potential is a very good question. It's huge, 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 because um, if you see the concentration of, for example, Dr. Ayla is the expert here, but I will talk on your behalf. Um, the, the concentration of, um, of alginate, for example, is around 60% of uh, dry weight, 60% of dry weight of, of uh, alginate. Alginate is very expensive. And if you see the large arrivals of sargassum, so we can produce more alginate in the world actually with just Cancun. So the potential for application and start some industrial business is I think very high. I think it's just it's a matter of starting now and be implemented soon no because I think in the future a lot of wanted to get into the big uh, business. Thank, thank you. Okay, thank you. And the second question, how difficult is to scale up some of the projects to use biomass uh, to value adult products? What is needed? Very, very good question. It depends on the product. It depends. If you are going to produce, let's say, for example, lacases, you don't need a big, big, large scale because a very minute concentration of lacase, a small, small concentration, it lasts for a long time. So probably 1,000 liters is a scale-up full facility. Of course, it's more expensive because you need to have everything in good manufacturing practices, uh, very clean rooms and so on, but it's small. I, if you see microalgae as a source of food, then we are talking of some hectares. So the reactors will be probably a million liters to become more uh, a business. So it depends. It, I, do, I would say it's not impossible, it's difficult because it requires a lot of attention, of details, planning, the design of the plan, all the unit operations. But uh, I mean, with the proper partners, we can scale it uh, quite easy. For, him, for example, IECOS, that they have infrastructure to implement some uh, plans. Thank you, Professor Parra. Uh, anyone in the forum? Yes. Thank you, Dr. Parra. Um, how do you think Mexico is positioned as a producer of new bioprocess systems in like the world panoramic? And what do you think could change to make it to make the projects that you're doing and the project group have more attention and be applied internationally? Uh, yeah, yeah, also very good question. If this is a very good question. Mexico has a huge potential to be top on the world, definitely. We have so many resources. You see what we've done with this only one fungi, Pignoporus sanguinis? We've done so many stuff and it's only one fungi. 
how many organisms we have, how many resources. The capacity is huge. The potential of brains like you is huge. Thing is, the implementation, the policy, as Nora mentioned, the ecosystem, as Professor Hafiz always mentioned, the ecosystem. We need to build this ecosystem and still, still uh, I think, under construction, I would say. <laughs> it will happen, but still not yet here. But the potential is huge, opportunities are huge, but there need to be more support for, for, for new researchers or entrepreneurs towards starting the business, making a business. But they're huge. I mean, the potential is huge. The only thing is, once you take the step, you will see that there are a lot of things that are not there or not that easy as in other countries. But um, it will be fantastic if we make the decision of turning Mexico in a big power in biotechnological applications of companies. Definitely, definitely the potential is to become top. Yes, very good. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Para, we have another interesting question. If the potential of sargassum is so high, why the process has not been applied? If the problem has many years causing problems on the Mexican coasts? Well, you know that. <laughs> it's, it's a big challenge because policy again. We are not allowed to harvest, let, I'm calling harvest, so picking the sargassum up from the open sea, unless the, the Navy, Mexican Navy, allow us to take the, so that is a big constraint, I would say, to take that step and to become a big business, because the higher quality of sargasso is the one in the sea. It once landed in the, in the seashore or in the sand, it is contaminated, it will rot in a way, and the production of good molecules is not going to be that good. So one is try to establish more open competition to get companies directly in the market. Again, the incentives to start a company of sargassum still not yet there, but the potential to apply and to, to produce something of that value, I think is there. It's just these barriers that are preventing. Otherwise, we were be starting a new company, no? <laughs> Yes, uh, thank you, Professor. Um, Dr. Dora Eliana Medina asks, what are the trends of a smart and sustainable city? What are the, the trends? trends? Of, of seaweed? No, see. A smart and sustainable city. Ah, okay. Well, what do you need is, uh, I would say water is one thing. There are a lot of technology. Let's say example of smart city Singapore. I take that as an example. And uh, Singapore is producing their own water. And they, they clean the water, they purify the water, and they drink their own water. So, so first, I think the trend need to be huge systems or very technified system of water uh, production. Also, a lot of data technology. A lot of um, smart city required information fast. So sensors, sensors everywhere to take a decision very fast for many things. Um, also, well, what we see is, uh, as you see, the transport is a very important uh, issue. So um, probably using new energy or ener green energy for the transport will be another. But there are many, probably I, I cannot mention all, but there are some of them. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Alexander Meneses uh, has another question. Uh, he would like to know your opinion about the main technical ch challenges that Senedesmus algae entails for wastewater treatment. Okay, Senedesmus. Well, it's the same problem as uh, always with microalgae is the contamination risk because uh, normally, to produce um, microalgae in uh, wastewater streams is the risk of contamination. You see, anything can grow there. So, Senedesmus, because it has a huge content of lipids, it's very, it's kind of a sweet 
for bacteria, sweet for bacteria. So if bacteria find Cenedesmus, they will kill the Cenedesmus and eat it up. So the, the main risk is to keep the, the, the system operating uh, properly. Alexander is an expert in wastewater. So he knows that if you need to operate with the minimum contamination, we cannot, we cannot remove totally the contamination, but we can have less contaminated system and allow the Cenedesmos to operate at the highest concentration we can. And then the downstreaming of that, if we are going to produce lipids, uh, will be, but it's possible, and Cenedesmos is not so weak. Remember, it has uh, three structures, three cells joined together, and it's kind of make them work together and, and beat the bacteria. So it's not, it's, it's, it has potential, yeah. But that's a risk. Contamination will be a risk. Okay, and we have another question uh, regarding sargassum. Mm -hmm. uh, Ting Hof uh, uh, asks, what do you see as the future of anaerobic biodigesters with sargassum? Oh, Tim, great, great team. Uh, this is a good question. I think it's a lot of potential. Uh, I would say it first to extract the, the nice and valuable molecules, and then we can explore the potential. We're working on that part on the COD, try to identify the remaining uh, COD can be, can be turned in methane and methane in energy. So I think it has potential, but I will say that it has more potential in the, in, in, in the other parts, but definitely we can produce a, a significant amount of energy from the sargassum, yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have many people uh, sharing uh, good wishes and congratulations for your presentation thank you, thank in the you, thank chat. Thank you to all. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Parra, for your presentation. Uh, very interesting. As we see, there are many opportunities uh, to uh, establish new research lines to contribute to these uh, research lines that you are coordinating in your group. And we extend the uh, invitation uh, for the students and researchers to join us uh, and contribute with your expertise in these uh, investigations. Thank, thank you, you Professor Thank Parra. you all, thank you all the team. Thank you and hopefully see you soon.